folks and welcome back to contract A. This is week three of our unit and this week we are looking at the second of our contract prerequisites. Last week number one was intention to create legal relations and this week we are looking at capacity to contract. So let's jump into our Prezi. Well, why on earth look at capacity to contract? If you think back to week one when we had a little look at theory, and yes, I'll be referring back to that at odd times throughout the term, uh, we learned that a contract needs to be the result of a meeting of the minds in that it has to be the free voluntary will of the parties. And we had a look at will theory, promise theory, consent theory, um, and in amongst that notion of a contract being the free voluntary or independent will of the parties, obviously, firstly, you have to intend that the contract's going to be legally binding. Firstly, that's what we did last week. But implicit in all of that notion is also, you need to understand what it is that you're about to do. Okay, you don't necessarily have to have an appreciation of all of the fine detail of what the contract says, but certainly you need to understand the general nature of what it is that you are contracting to do. And so that is where the prerequisite of capacity to contract kicks in. It's all about ensuring that the parties are equipped with a sufficient knowledge or understanding of you know, the general purport of what it is that they're going to do. There are two main areas um, that the courts have had to consistently deal with where questions of capacity have arisen over the years and they are the issue of minors and uh, people with some form of mental incapacity. So they are the main areas that we are going to be looking at today. Firstly as to minors. So it might seem a bit strange for you uh, young whippersnappers that have been brought up in the modern era to hear us talking about minors. Most of the talk nowadays tends to be about underage people, underage drinkers, underage offenders. Uh, but minors is the kind of technical term that we tend to uh, revert to in law. And a minor is anyone that has not yet attained the age of majority, slightly antiquated language there, but it just means anyone that's under 18. What legislation tells us that? And yes, this is set in legislation. Um, it's uh, all of the state and territory legislation that deals with this issue and you'll find the names of the legislation in the text. Um, most of the various bits and pieces of the legislation are called things like, you know, the Age of Majority Act or, um, you know, Minors and so-and-so, you know, other things act. So you'll see the, the names of the legislation in the text um, if you need to look that up. Um, however, notwithstanding that we do have pieces of legislation in this area, um, it tends to be governed by uh, the common law. Some of the state and territory legislation uh, has changed things a little around the edges, um, some states more than others, but generally speaking, we need to still be familiar with the common law because the legislation really just tinkers around with it. It doesn't really change it uh, wholly and solely. So what's the general position? The general position is that Contracts with minors, generally speaking, won't be enforceable against the minor. However, there are some fairly narrow exceptions and if the circumstances meet the qualifications for those exceptions, then the contract will either be binding, just binding, no questions asked, or binding unless repudiated. So let's have a look at those. Uh, first, we start here with the general position. Contracts are not binding against minors, generally speaking, just across the board. You can't enforce a contract with a minor. The only way that you can is if two things happen. Firstly, the minor turns 18, attains their majority, and secondly, they ratify the contract. That is, they have to take some step, do something that affirms that they accept the, uh, the obligations contained in the contract. However, on the flip side, the minor can enforce the contract against the adult, so 
go minor. Uh, the other thing is too that um, these contracts, uh, they are effective to transfer property. Now, I'll talk about restitution and restitutionary claims uh, in this area in just a minute, but you should also note that the legislation has some bearing on that proposition there, uh, when and how property is transferred and uh, the ability to claim property back under these kinds of contracts. So the general starting position, you're not going to be able to enforce a contract against a minor, they can enforce it against you, however. Mm -hmm. Next step, some contracts will be binding and you've only really got to have a brief look at your study guide or more preferably the text to realise why this is. Um, very narrow circumstances where the contracts will just be binding across the board and they are contracts for necessaries and contracts for employment or apprenticeship. In terms of necessaries, of course, a miner is going to be able to make a contract, for example, to purchase food. They've got to live somehow. So contracts for an infant's benefit and relating to the infant's person, necessaries, food, clothing, lodging, that is premises, a place to stay, a place to sleep, uh, contracts of marriage, interestingly enough, and contracts of apprenticeship or service. They were all uh, mentioned in the case of Cohen and Neil. Now the test that you've got to get your heads around here is a two-part test. The first part is a question of law, the second part is a question of fact. Okay, so the first part says, is it capable of being a necessary? Is this thing that the miner wants to purchase or services that the miner wishes to purchase, is it something necessary for that, that miner's person? Is it beneficial and necessary for their person? The, um, the plaintiff that wants to uphold the contract has the burden of proof of showing that this is so. Now, this is a question that the judge has to decide. And for the second part, you have to show that in these particular circumstances, uh, this particular miner, this particular contract, these goods or services, are they actually required by the minor? And that will be a question of fact that goes to the jury. In terms of uh, whether a necessary is capable of um, in law being classed as a necessary, um, has to be services or goods. If it is goods, then the sale of goods legislation will, uh, will apply to that particular transaction. And uh, that legislation provides that if necessaries are sold and delivered, then the miner has to pay a reasonable price. Sold and delivered. Miner has to pay a reasonable price, okay? Because remembering, remembering that in all circumstances, it needs to be hmm, contracts for an infant's benefit, okay? It's not going to be to an infant's benefit if they've contracted to pay an unreasonable or extortionate price, okay? So sale of goods says, if they're sold and delivered, reasonable price, sorry, you've got to pay even if you're a minor. Uh, but remember in uh, amongst all of that, that the goods have to be necessaries, okay? So they have to be for the minor's uh, person, usually goods like food, uh, reasonable clothing, um, places to sleep and so forth. So where you've got ostentatious things um, that are being bought by the miner, no judge is going to say that they're unnecessary. So in Ryder and Wombwell, uh, you've got this pair of jeweled solitaires and an antique goblet uh, being presented as necessary. Uh, no. The next thing that you need to look at is a question of fact. And here is where your case analysis comes in. And a lot of these cases you will see, interestingly enough, tend to span uh, from the 1850s through to about the 1950s, maybe 1960s. Uh, seems to have been a very uh, active time for uh, the law growing in this area. I guess as contract was growing in, in um as a whole, and also the law of torts was growing as a whole as well. And courts really had a, an eagle eye out uh, 
um, particularly because torts really was in its infancy and contracts was a little further ahead, uh, courts did find um, some responsibility, I guess, in terms of protecting minors from what they would call catching bargains. Um, the, the predators out there that wanted to prey on the minors that uh, uh, fell into their wicked trap of whatever they were trying to sell them. So in Nash and Inman, uh, we have we have the, uh, the the plaintiff's traveller had met with a, stu a student at uh, Trinity College um, at Cambridge, I think it was, um, and and the word had gotten around that this poor kid was spending money pretty liberally. <laughs> <laughs> opportunity knocks. Uh, they managed to sell this poor kid uh, 11 fancy waistcoats in about nine months. I don't know how you would wear out a waistcoat per month, but uh, got him into this contract worth more than 120 pounds, I think it was. So it was quite a lot of money uh, for those days. 1908, this is. Um, was a, a bunch of fancy waistcoats necessary in the circumstances no obviously not um again courts have got one eye on this this fact that each contract if they're going to hold it up has to be for the infant's overall benefit okay the burden has to be proportionate to the benefit and in fact the benefit has to outweigh the burden so in Saltman and Bond, um, where a young miner had gotten themselves engaged to be married, wanted to buy a house, construct a house for, uh, you know, the, the proverbial white picket, picket, picket feds, blah, blah, uh, so that they could um, have kids and, and raise their children in the house. The question was whether the materials and labour were, um, the contract for materials and labour were was enforceable against the miner. And in that case, no, the, um, the benefits did not outweigh the burdens. And the burdens, as you'll know, if you've ever built a house, are fairly significant. Uh, extreme cost and time involved in those kinds of contracts. And the court said, no, sorry, the benefit here, not, not necessary for this particular plaintiff. So that's contracts for um, goods and services that, that fall into this category of being necessaries and satisfy the, the two-pronged test. What about the next circumstance of contracts for employment? Sometimes they are called beneficial contracts of service or uh, articles of clerkship. Sometimes they're called indentures. Um, why on earth would they be enforceable uh, against a minor? Pretty obvious really. Hamilton and Lethbridge said it best. Uh, it's the means of maintaining themselves, so therefore they are not allowed to destroy the contractual basis for maintaining themselves. It's obviously going to be to their benefit. Uh, you have to look uh, at the contract as a whole and judge whether it is for the miner's benefit. Uh, the miner, again, can choose to repudiate these kinds of contract uh, upon attaining their majority. What about employment contracts that have not been classed as beneficial? And I guess these are really uh, more the exception than the rule because generally speaking, even if there are a few onerous um, T's and C's in terms and conditions in, in an employment contract, um, if on balance it's okay, the court will, you know, will enforce that. However, there have been some fairly extreme examples of um, employers that really were not looking out for their employees in a meaningful sense, and therefore the court has actually uh, struck them down at the request of the miners. Now here, the, the first one, I, I do have a soft spot for this case, perhaps because I've just seen The Greatest Showman about 53 times because my kids love it. <laughs> Happy tea board at your service. Um, Di Francesco and Barnum is the case. Again, 1890, so another one of these kind of catching bargains um, kind of cases. We had some minors, uh, some girls that were engaged to do dancing for Di Francesco. And uh, <laughs> the contracts were really quite one-sided. 
there were parts of the contracts that were okay um, and certainly uh, the court was at pains to say that they didn't generally think that De Francesco was running uh, his business in a manner that was um, wholly unsatisfactory for the miners under his care. I mean, he certainly had educational opportunities for them available and so forth. But there were a few things in this particular employment contract uh, that tipped it over uh, and allowed the court to declare that it wasn't actually in the miners' best interests. What were those things that tipped it over? Uh, part of the problem was that uh, the miners really couldn't depend on the contract for pretty much anything at all, actually. Um, all it was was an agreement that uh, if and when Di Francesco wanted to engage them for performances, that they must perform for him and for him only. So you can see there on the one, two, three, fourth bullet point there, they weren't allowed to work for anybody else. So they basically had to be at De Francesco's beck and call and they were only paid just for the performances that he asked them to, to render for him. So there was no wages uh, scenario. They were just paid the fees for the actual engagements. Um, there were other things also in this contract that were a little bit odd, a little bit unusual. They weren't allowed to marry and uh, they had to go wherever he sent them basically. So foreign countries, America, you name it, he could send them any, anywhere. Uh, and Di Francesco could end the contract at any time. So he basically had these kids at his beck and call. Um, he didn't have to give them any engagements uh, and he had the added competitive benefit that they couldn't go and work for anybody else. Um, if he didn't want to give them any engagements and he only had to pay them just for the engagements that, that he actually allocated to them. So obviously in those kinds of circumstances, the, the kids should have been at liberty to, to go out and work for Barnum if they wanted to, to pick up a, a bit of extra cash in order to, you know, make a living. Um, really too restrictive so far as these miners were concerned. <coughs> The Toronto Major uh, Junior A Hockey Club uh, case was another case that was more the exception than the rule. Also, the case in that scenario that uh, the contract was not in the miners' best interest. And uh, that was a nasty little clause. It's what we would ordinarily call a reach through clause. And we had uh, this miner being. Um, uh, employed by the hockey club but interestingly for a period of three years after the contract ended if that uh, uh, minor that was the contracting party decided to go and work professionally for another club uh, then that minor would be obliged to give the um, the Toronto club 20% a cut of 20% of their professional fees so mm, that's a bit of overreaching there again not in the miners best interests and therefore uh was able to be um set aside by the court <coughs> so that is the issue of uh employment contracts okay so that's probably enough for part one and in part two we'll come back and we will have a little look at contracts that are binding unless repudiated so i'll see you in part two bye guys <laughs>